Uh, thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes? Okay, good. Um, I want to start by saying that I really hate the term nanny state. And I hate that term for two reasons. Firstly, I hate it because I actually quite liked my nanny, which is what we called uh, our grandmother. And I liked her not least because she was the opposite of the nanny state. Her daily breakfast was a bottle of stout. She, she only ever ate stale bread because she thought it tasted nicer than fresh bread. And she smoked all the time. And if anyone ever complained about her cigarette smoke, she said that they could always go outside while she finished and then they could come back in afterwards. <laughs> so I've always, found, I've always found the term nanny state quite jarring because where my family comes from, which is the kind of bog lands of Western Ireland, nannies or nanas or whatever we call them were pretty hardcore people living spectacularly unhealthy lives and yet still managing to make it to 100. And the second reason I hate the term nanny state is because I think it massively underestimates the authoritarian problem we face in the 21st century. It's such a quaint term. It gives the impression that we are surrounded by these kind of bossy Mary Poppins figures kind of pointing a finger at us for being naughty. And it's such a soft term as well, implying that the problem with a state today is that it's a bit patronizing a bit whiny, always ready to you know, snatch our cigarettes and stop us from drinking and so on. Now, while it is true that we do live under killjoy regimes that don't like the idea of us partying and cutting loose, that is only one small part of a very large problem that we face today. Because what we have in the 21st century is not just an irritating nanny state, but an utterly out of control bureaucratic imperative an utterly unhinged interventionist dynamic that has lost any sense of what areas of life it is appropriate for the authorities to interfere in and what areas of life it is not appropriate for the authorities to interfere in. We live under governments that relentlessly interfere in family life, in home life, in private life, governments which think nothing of telling parents how to raise their kids or telling adults how to have sex, or setting out to reshape our behavior and even our minds. We live under a state, in other words, that thinks individuals should have no internal moral life of their own. So we should stop making this sound cutesy by calling it a nanny state and face up to the fact that the modern state actually has more in common with the Inquisition than it does with uh, Mary Poppins. And I think too often uh, we libertarians risk become cari becoming caricatures of ourselves by only focusing on the lifestyle interventions of the modern state. So we spend a lot of time challenging smoking bans uh, and agitating against state-enforced pub closing times. Now I agree that these are pesky and unnecessary government measures. I think they are driven by the miserabilism and misanthropy of modern elites who think fun times will always end in violence and mayhem. And it's very important, I think, to challenge these things and to stand up for the right of people to smoke where they want to smoke and the right of private institutions to allow people to get as drunk as they want them to get. But it is important that we don't lose sight of the fact that these are fairly minor facets of a much larger onslaught on private life and even on the life of the mind and the life of the soul. So yes, it is extremely annoying that you can't get pissed in some Australian cities after 4 a.m. Yes, it is annoying that in Britain, you can't smoke at a bus stop, you can't smoke in a taxi, you can't smoke in mental hospitals, which means you have all these kind of uh, lunatics with nowhere to go and nowhere to have a cigarette. Those things are very annoying. But they are only the most outward expressions of a deeper interventionist logic. And it is that deeper interventionist logic that we really need to challenge today. And what we have, in essence, are governments that have shifted from focusing on infrastructural and economic issues towards obsessing over individuals' behavior, thoughts, and relationships. For most of the modern era, governments had a fairly narrow remit. Their job was to keep nations secure, to enable prosperity, and to protect property and individuals from criminal damage and criminal harm. 
Today, in a massive turnaround, we have what the British Labour Party calls the politics of behaviour, or what the ever-growing nudge industry calls behavioural economics, or the politics of behavioural insight. We have governments that have moved from keeping the external infrastructural world chugging along to governments that are concerned with policing and correcting the internal lives of their citizens. And we need to recognize the extent to which this represents a winding back of the Enlightenment itself. Because the Enlightenment era is based fundamentally on a belief that governments should only concern, concern themselves with outward things and not with inward things. So in his letter on tolerance, published in 1689, John Locke said his aim was to settle the bounds that lie between the business of government and the business of morality. Locke said a government should only concern itself with the following, the safety and security of the commonwealth and of every particular man's goods and person. Governments, he said, should have nothing to do with the inward persuasion of the mind. So he said there's a magistrate on one side and there's individual conscience on the other and the two should never be mixed up. Or as he brilliantly put it, the care of souls does not belong to the magistrate. Every man's soul belongs to himself and is to be left to himself. Today we have the complete opposite of that. We have governments that are largely bereft of ideas for how to improve infrastructure or, or economic matters, and so who concern themselves to a crazy degree with the inward lives of their citizens. And yes, one form that takes is the nanny state stuff. The annoying meddling into our lifestyles, our social pastimes, and so on. And these nanny state interventions do indeed capture the extent to which the modern state is keen to intervene even into the life of the body and the life of the soul. So we now have governments that think nothing of telling us to where we can smoke, stopping us from seeing cigarette branding, preventing us from drinking after a particular time, plastering our foodstuffs with warnings about how unhealthy they are, banning adverts for junk food, stopping our children from having salt during school hours, rifling through children's lunch boxes in search of contraband like chocolate and crisps and Coca-Cola, banning drugs, banning absinthe, banning extra large servings of fizzy drinks, and so on and so on. And what these nanny state actions show is that governments now even aspire to control what we put into our bodies, how healthy we are. And this is taken for granted as a legitimate thing for governments to do. But that, too, runs counter to the enlightened belief that people should, be, should have the right to make the wrong choices, including the choice to make themselves ill. In fact, the great men of the Enlightenment stood up for the right to be ill. So John Locke, in his letter on toleration, he said, what if a man neglects the care of his own health? Should the magistrate provide a law stopping that man from becoming ill. And then he answered his question. He said, no, the government should not tell people how sick or how healthy they should be. And he said, we should be free even to make ourselves sick. He said the following, laws provide as much as is possible that the goods and health of subjects be not injured by the fraud and violence of others. They do not guard them from the negligence of the possessors themselves. In other words, individuals should be so free to control their consciences and their bodies that they should be even allowed to let themselves fall into a state of disrepair. Today's nanny staters who want to protect people from their own unhealthy choices really should bear that in mind. Because today, in another serious transgression of Enlightenment values, we have rulers who really do want dominion even over our stomachs and our hearts and our lungs, over our state of health, our physical health and our moral health. And this represents a serious diminishing 
of our individual sovereignty and of our moral autonomy, of our right to determine our destinies free from the diktats of officialdom. But alongside that nanny state meddling that we're all familiar with and lots of us campaign on, there are other, and in some ways even worse, forms of state authoritarianism today. Firstly, there's the nudge industry. Now, to my mind, these nudges make the nanny state look almost harmless in comparison. Where the nanny state is mainly concerned with policing our bodies and our health, the nudge industry wants to colonize our minds. Nudging, which started in America and has since moved to Britain, and I gather is now gathering steam here in Australia, is based on the idea that governments must make decisions on our behalf. Nudging takes many forms. There is the famous example of putting an image of a fly onto a urinal in order to encourage men to urinate in the correct direction and not to do too much splashing. <laughs> Across Europe, I, I guarantee you, in Europe, every urinal you see will have a fly on it, and it's, it's, just deter it's made to nudge men to do the right thing. Um, but there are also uh, other nudging discussions like reducing road space when you build new towns or new areas in order to nudge people to walk more or to cycle more and as a consequence to become less fat and more eco-friendly. There are also discussions about changing the packaging on certain food products so that unhealthy foods will look attractive and our minds will say unconsciously we're not going to take that and healthy foods will look more attractive and so on and so forth. They're obsessed with nudging us, subtly nudging us to make the right choices and do the right thing. And the idea behind all this nudging is that individuals are so irrational, so incapable of working out what is in our own best interest, that faceless officials must nudge us towards doing what is apparently right and proper. So in Britain, in Downing Street itself, we have something called a behavioral insight team, which is as terrifyingly Orwellian as it sounds. And its job is, and I quote, I'm not making this up, its job is to change the way citizens think. Now, I don't know if you, if, I don't know if you remember what democracy is supposed to be all about, but democracy is supposed to be about governments doing and reflecting what citizens think, representing what citizens think. Now, somehow, we've arrived at a situation where governments see it as their role to change what citizens think, to control what citizens think. It's a complete uh, transformation of what democracy means. And the Behavioral Insight team in Downing Street published a report recently which said that people are often systematically irrational, and therefore the government must change the way people act. And how should the government do this? The report said it should become people's surrogate willpower. It actually uses that phrase, surrogate willpower. I think we should take a moment to think about what that means. Because the suggestion here is that people are so foolish, so fickle, so systematically irrational, that officialdom must become our minds. It must think and make decisions on our behalf. It must become our will and exercise our will for us. So what we have here is an attempted colonization of the mind itself, with officials imagining that they have both the right and the ability to reshape our minds in order to program us to do the right things as they see it, to stop eating junk food, to cycle more, to become organ donors, to urinate in the right direction, and so on and so forth. All these things that we apparently cannot work out for ourselves. That is totalitarianism. Because anyone who has read 1984 will know that the ending of that book, the terrible ending of that book, is when the state occupies Winston Smith's mind. And the torturer, O'Brien, actually says to Winston, we create human nature Men are infinitely malleable. That is precisely what the nudge industry thinks. That it is the creator of human nature, that it is the surrogate willpower of malleable mankind. And in fact, 
the massively contradictory term that the nudge industry uses to describe its policies, which is libertarian paternalism, really brings to mind the 1984 slogan, freedom is slavery. It contains the same, it contains the same knowing contradiction. Liberty is paternalism. That is the rallying cry of the new invaders of the human mind. You can also see the colonization of the mind in the new politics of happiness. Across the Western world, particularly in Britain and also in America, we now have whole sections of government that are devoted to measuring our happiness levels and working out how they might be improved. They want to micromanage even our most private emotions. And that is very different, it should be said, from the mention of happiness in the American Declaration of Independence. Because that declaration said individuals, it's a great declaration, I'm a big fan, it said that individuals should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, it recognized that happiness could not be imposed from on high, but rather had to be pursued by the individual himself through his carving out of a life plan and his exercise of moral autonomy. Today, by contrast, we have officials at the UN and in national governments who really think they can make us happy, who devote themselves to massaging this most intimate emotion. And this brings to mind uh, Huxley's Brave New World, because in that novel, I don't know if you remember, but the tyrannical rulers in that world created by Huxley also wanted to impose a system of what they called universal happiness. And strikingly, one of the rebels who, who fights back against the system, he says the following, I want freedom, I want goodness, I want sin, I am claiming the right to be unhappy. And I think today we should also claim the right to be unhappy and unhealthy and fat and drunk against our rulers who think they can police our bodies, colonize our minds and transform our emotions. And alongside the nanny state's colonization of the body and the nudge industry's invasion of the mind, we also have relentless state intervention into our relationships as well. And this, I think, is one of the most pernicious forms of state authoritarianism today because it's having a really corrosive impact on family life and on community life. It takes many different forms. There is officialdom's branding of entire groups of people, usually less well-off people, as problem families or chaotic families who apparently require the constant guidance of social workers experts, super nannies, and so on. There is also the phenomenon of parenting classes, which some parents are forced to attend if they are judged to have lapsed in their care of their kids. In Britain at the moment, and I know this reflects discussions that have taken place in Australia, there is an effort to criminalize emotional neglect of children, which can mean pretty much anything. For example, it can mean forcing your daughter to go to ballet every single weekend, even though she doesn't want to. That can be a form of emotional neglect, and you could potentially be punished for it. There is also the increasingly influential pseudoscientific nonsense about early years, as they call it, where it's now claimed that an individual's entire character and life fortunes are determined by what happens to him in the first five years of his life. How you are parented, whether you are read to, whether your father hugs you or doesn't hug you, apparently this determines everything that will happen to you for the next 70 or 80 years of your life. So across the world now, in America, Britain and Australia, there is more and more early years intervention designed to instruct parents on how to bring up their children in such a way that they won't become screw-ups for life. So from hectoring parents to lecturing everyone about safe sex to plying teenagers with non-stop relationships advice, the modern state is clearly not just content with telling us what to eat and how to think, it also wants to govern how we relate to one another. And in essence, what we have today is a dictatorship of do-gooders who are 
determined to colonize pretty much every area of our lives. And this dictatorship of do-gooders is actually doing no good at all. In fact, it is doing enormous harm to both individual freedom and to society. It is undermining individual moral autonomy through inviting people to rely more on the state rather than on their own judgment in matters of health, morality, conscience, and so on. It is weakening the family through implicitly communicating to children the idea that there are experts out there who are better at bringing them up than their own parents are. The sovereignty of the family is being completely undermined. And it is destroying community life through introducing more and more petty legislation, petty rules, and petty regulations that govern how we may behave in our local areas and which encourage us to see the local smoker or the local drunk as threats to our way of life rather than just eccentric characters who live in our uh, areas. All this top-down rulemaking is making it more difficult for communities to take responsibility for antisocial behavior. It weakens communities and strengthens faceless officials who tell people how to behave. So it's really not enough to refer to this as a nanny state. That completely undermines what's happening here. It makes it seem quaint and quite funny. And it's not really quaint or funny. Because what we're really witnessing today, I think, is an historic winding down of the Enlightenment ideals of moral independence and freedom of choice. And we are seeing their replacement by an inquisitorial state that wants to tell us what to think, how healthy to be, even how we should relate to our own friends, our own loved ones, our own mothers and fathers. We are witnessing the policing of every single facet of our moral, physical, and social lives. Nannies don't do that. Tyrants do that. These nannies, nudgers, and relationship police always say that they're just trying to make us all more responsible. They're just trying to encourage us to take more responsibility for our lives and for our communities and for our families. What they don't understand is another ideal that came out of the Enlightenment which is that you can only take real responsibility for your life if you are free, if you are morally autonomous. If you're told how to behave constantly, then you have no responsibility over your life and the decisions that are made in your life. This is what John Stuart Mill said very clearly. He said, the human faculties of perception, judgment, mental activity, and even moral preference are exercised only in making a choice. The mental and moral muscles are only improved by being used. Today, we are discouraged from using our mental and moral muscles. Instead, officials think on our behalf, moralize on our behalf, exercise willpower on our behalf, and basically reduce us to the level of what Mill referred to as apes imitating the instructions of others rather than carving out our own moral path and taking responsibility for our lives. And the end result is emasculated citizens, divided families, tense communities, and less freedom. So today, we have far more to worry about than the right to smoke. It is the enlightenment right to be a thoughtful, morally independent human being that is being taken away from us.